This Viewfinder episode is supported by UC Davis Health System, transforming the future of healthcare. It feels like electricity going through your shoulders. Something that kind of creeps up. Back and neck pain, persistent, sometimes debilitating. It's an ache and a gnawing. More than 80% of us will experience it at least once during our lifetime. I cried every day. Tears are streaming down my eyes. It can lead to almost paralyzing pain and profound depression. No. The intensity was growing, 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 growing. We were seeing him deteriorate. It's the second most common cause of disability in the U.S. I don't want to be an invalid. But hope is emerging. On this program, we'll explore new research and treatment. We're at a point now in medicine which is exciting. A remarkable revolution in understanding pain. Medical breakthroughs for those who suffer. We can actually prevent or jam that signal from ever reaching the brain. New strategies that bring hope for a better life. This is a whole lifestyle change. Three, two, one, hit it, go. Don't let your knee deviate. Yes, yeah, go, go, go. You got it. Hurry, come on, get the bar set up for your own body. The human body is an extraordinary machine. It's engineered to bend and move. But when things go wrong, there can be mystery pain. Kelly gets a little special attention because she's coming back from an injury, a little flare up. I just have that phantom back pain that didn't, didn't come from injury, didn't come from an accident. At Folsom Physical Therapy, these folks are making an investment together, using sweat equity to conquer that chronic ache. Couldn't sleep at night, I mean, wicked pain. And recover from major injuries. Two spinal fractures, four pelvic fractures, and a hand fracture. So what would possess people with debilitating pain to put themselves through all this? risking more soreness in the process. I don't have that pain anymore, it's zero. It's immediate, and I get strong right away. To understand how it works, one must learn to think like an athlete and delve into how pain functions, given the unique and remarkable nature of the spine. Many people think of the spine as a pillar, but it really is a, it's an extraordinary, exquisitely engineered organ that essentially disperses forces, almost like a snake. No one area of the spine receives more force than another if the organ's working properly. The spine is the body's framework. Like girders on a bridge, it suspends us against gravity through decades of activity. A normal spine should last a lifetime. So um, people with good, healthy spines, um, the spine doesn't break down. As we age, the spine naturally loses some elasticity. Deformities like scoliosis make it worse. So can injuries from lifting with bad posture, says Dr. Janine Barra. I can back squat 205 pounds, and that was from doing a deadlift, I think, the first time when I hurt myself because I wasn't using proper technique. Maintain a nice tight back. Good. Up. Good. Give me five more. The spine is essentially housing the spinal cord, which is an extension of the brain. So it's really part of the central nervous system. And out of that spinal cord emanates all of the nerves that innervate our body, from really the, the neck down. Wherever force becomes concentrated, a hot spot develops. If a nerve is nudged or pinched, pain can show up in the neck, back, or in other parts of the body. It results in the nerve calling out for help. Patients may have a burning. They may have electrical-like sensations. And it's all the result of these signals that are, are chemicals, actually, that are released in our body. And our brain is trying to process those chemicals and has trouble doing that. It first began when I was in my mid-30s. My job requires travel, so I can remember my last trip to Fresno for a um, business trip. I carried a cooler with three ice packs, and I would rotate the ice packs the whole way down and the whole way back. For Belton Noseworthy, just the thought of a car trip is enough to trigger a pain sensation. And as a cyclist, hiker, and trail runner, 
This is a guy with a high pain tolerance. I mean, he's always go, 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 do, do, do. He does not sit still. I feel free. It just feels great to be outdoors and just being in the outdoors and experiencing new things and new places and scenery. I just love being up in the mountains. Felton's wife sensed trouble two decades ago when she noticed he wasn't sleeping well. I mean, pain, pain, pain. I could see it in his face. I could see it in his body movements. He just, you know, you couldn't shake it off. Over time, Belton's neck became stiff, his back harder to turn and flex. He lost weight to take pressure off his spine as doctors began to pinpoint the source of his pain. With dozens of potential causes, doctors rely on patients for clues. Hello there. About 60 to 80% of the diagnosis you make can be done just based off the history before you even examine a patient. Um, so if we take the time to really hear the patient, find out what their symptoms are, how they've happened, the timing of it, we can often determine what the problem is. In advanced cases, it can take a team to sort it out. There are physiatrists, neurologists, uh, neurosurgeons, anesthesiologists, acupuncturists, social workers that all participate in this team. We know that that's needed in pain. Here's the rub. While structural problems can be seen on a scan, other types of pain are invisible. I often get patients where I get stumped. I look at imaging studies, I look at other information that I have, and again, these are patients who have a real pain. It's not like something that they just dreamed up. What's more, many diseases and conditions can mimic back pain, from organ failure to even cancer. All have to be ruled out. Be asking the patient if they have had any fevers, any bowel or bladder changes, any um, weakness, like inability to lift up an arm or a leg, depending on if we're talking neck pain or lower back pain. Most people don't have any of that. One common problem involves the spinal discs, the rubbery shock absorbers that hold space open for the nerves. As we age, the discs become dehydrated, and there is some normal wear and tear. Doctors warn some behaviors speed up the process. When you smoke, um, it does uh, affect the blood vessels, including the blood vessels uh, that, go, uh, that go to spine. It uh, becomes even uh, more difficult for the nutrition, the nutrients, uh, to get to uh, where it needs to go. Uh, so when you smoke, uh, you're basically causing greater problem with accelerated degeneration. Another problem? In our culture, we sit a lot. I would say I probably spend like 60 to 70 percent of my day at my desk. I've had really sharp pains like here in my shoulder that just, you know, out of nowhere just like start really hurting and I have to try to rub it myself. Too much sitting puts the spine under pressure that it's not designed to withstand. Over time, the discs can slip, bulge, and even rupture or herniate, putting pressure on the nerves. It can lead to a condition some call tech neck. If I sit like this, now I'm straining my neck, I'm straining my lower back, and now if I sit like this all day, I'm gonna have neck pain, I'm gonna have low back pain, I might even have chest wall pain from collapsing forward. I thought I might be having a heart attack, uh, so actually we went to the ER and had an x-ray and that confirmed that I started to have a degenerating disc at C5 uh, and 6 area. Belton's x-rays tell the story, the spine slowly collapsing over time. The symptoms, back and neck pain, are some of the most common reasons Americans go to the doctor. The Institute of Medicine says we have 100 million Americans with chronic pain at a uh, cost of approximately $600 billion a year in direct and indirect costs. It's, they're staggering numbers. We're going to have to look at preventing these pain states. In cases like Belton's, research into regenerative medicine holds promise. This involves using stem cells to regrow the discs, vertebrae, and even soft tissue surrounding the spine. There is a new age interest in harnessing our own internal capacity to heal. And the cells themselves are kind of like commandos. It's kind of like an old typecast film with Arnold Schwarzenegger being dropped into the jungle somewhere. The stem cells, once they're placed into the disc, the theory is these cells respond to the environment. By regenerating them, 
we restore the natural environment to the disc. While stem cell research continues, today's specialists customize treatment to the individual, planning around what the patient wants to do in life. Should we do it? How we frame the conversation is now not so much of the paternalism of Marcus Welby uh, in the old days of take two of these and call me in the morning. It's more of what would you like to do if you were able to turn down the volume on the pain dial? Oh, I'd love to swim again, or I'd love to walk my dogs, or I'd love to uh, participate more with my grandchildren. As patients explore their options, out of sheer desperation, many ask about surgery. But most doctors are cautious. Because the spinal cord is an extension of the brain, operating on it is risky. Let's try something very benign first, uh, and then if it doesn't work, kind of stepwise fashion, uh, do something more aggressive, and let's leave uh, surgical treatment as something of last resort. Pain medications have historically been used as a first line of defense. But Belton knows where they turned down the offer, knowing the path it can sometimes take. I didn't really care for taking the narcotic pain medication, so I refused to take those. We were misconstrued in some way because the suggestion is that the bulk of the pain care that we provide revolves around one planet in the solar system, and that's morphine. Um, we're currently in the middle of a prescription drug abuse crisis in America. Still, Belton preferred to take his fitness regimen to even higher levels, using his body's natural endorphins to try to deaden the pain. I have some numbers that I saved from some running events that I did, and, and I did the beta breakers every year, which is kind of a fun run. Another patient, Paul Levois, gave medications a try. The pain was really started after I got married in my early, no, I would say my late 30s. Paul lives for family vacations, but arthritis began to erode his neck and back diminishing his quality of life. He loves the beach, but he'd be in so much pain that sometimes he couldn't even make it out to the beach to hang out and swim. I would come home and I would basically almost be in tears, you know, ready to take my pills and I, I would just go to bed, you know, waiting for my pills to to start uh, lowering my pain. Paul knows that his pain has an important function. It's the body's signal that a problem needs to be addressed. Um, in the normal setting, pain's an alarm that turns off once the potential harm, harm or healing has resolved. In the disease of pain, when it becomes a chronic illness, that alarm system doesn't turn off normally. And by by not turning off, it becomes a source of, of great suffering, if not torture. Muscle relaxants, prescription steroid injections, and anti-inflammatories can dial back the alarm. Paul's pain diminished. Unfortunately, so did his ability to concentrate. When he was awake, I could tell he just was not engaged. Paul was still able to work, but as years passed, his spine lost its stability. His medications weren't as effective. My pain was so high and so intense that my vision would turn blurry and black, you know, dark. Intensity was growing, 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 growing. We would sometimes wake up to sirens and watching firefighters coming down the stairs wailing him out from having seized and convulsed from the pain. In advanced cases, doctors may offer surgery. One option, spinal fusion, uses rods and plates to stabilize a weak spine. This is a very common surgery, uh, patients with a pinched nerve and also a slipped vertebrae. In the past, doctors fused large sections of the spine. Paul Levois had this procedure in 2001 to take pressure off the nerves. Although I lost mobility, I still can move my head probably, my doctor said, 60%. So it's not really bad, 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 but there are certain occasions like I can't do a lot of things that I used to do before, you know. Today, surgeons can fuse smaller sections of the spine together using brackets. This is a less invasive uh, way of approaching the uh, spine rather than going from the back. 
As an archer, Belton Noseworthy needs a flexible spine to aim and shoot. Belton researched fusion, but decided to hold out for a treatment that was a better personal fit. There seems to be a high level of reoccurring surgeries based on two segments being fused, that the segments above and below that fused area are taking a lot of pressure. So I, concern, I was concerned that at an early age, getting a fusion would require additional fusion down the road. As patients weigh risks and benefits, the choice is personal. Ann Moore faced fusion surgery last year after a horse bucked her and she hit the ground, cracking her back and pelvis. I remember hitting the ground and thinking, wow, that was a hard fall. They were calling for help. They were calling the EMTs and the helicopter couldn't land because it was too foggy. And then got to the hospital and I was like, well, let's do an x-ray. And it's like, you've got some fractures there and they look pretty serious. The break was dangerously close to her spinal cord, putting Anne at risk of paralysis. They were going to fuse the spine at the level of my fracture, which was at T12. But then, a surprise. The neurosurgery attending, Dr. Kim, came by and said that he could treat me just with a TLSO brace that I would have to wear for three months. But that sounded a lot better than surgery. Anne was physically fit, which she knew would enhance her recovery. She opted for the brace and was fast-tracked into physical therapy within two weeks of the accident. I dodged a bullet, dodged a big bullet. In the meantime, the relief that Paul Levallois experienced after his fusion gradually faded. New hot spots flared up. Doctors injected pain-blocking drugs straight to a nerve at the base of his skull, which helped. But eventually, the risks outweighed the benefits. The doctor said, I can't keep doing this because it's going to hurt your liver, it's going to hurt your heart, and it's going to cause you more pain or more problems health problems. Waves of desperation overwhelmed him. He just broke down and said, like, what more do I have to prove about how much pain I'm in? And Moore says feelings of isolation can run deep in a way that only those who suffer back and neck pain truly know. I cried every day. Tears were streaming down my eyes. I was trying not to um, <laughs> share that with as many people as possible. But it was a very, a feeling of hopelessness. People in pain, um, their lives get smaller and smaller. I could no longer do the things I enjoy doing. That even doing my job, day-to-day -day work, was a real challenge. I was living in pain 24-7. You just feel like, you know, why am I existing? This is, I, I'm living with pain every single day. When thoughts go dark, it's important to reach out to those who understand and take the pain seriously. Many people feel that if we address the mind, we're attributing the pain to a mental disorder. Um, and, and this is always a problem for me because um, I long ago realized that you can't have pain without a head. It means that the mind and body go together. After Mike Raymaker wrenched his back, his experience topped the charts. I couldn't even swing my golf club up to parallel to the ground. Devastating. Where we become anxious, depressed, fearful, all of those things amplify pain. As patients receive therapy, pain specialists give them skill sets that address the mind and body together. We are capable as human beings to amplify pain with our minds, but we're also very capable to de-amplify it, to attenuate it or turn it down um, with, with mental control. For Mike, quality of life would improve if you could just drive a car without hurting. If I can get you reclined, there's less compression on your back as you go. Just sitting here like this, I can feel that there's not so much compression on my hips down here. Exactly. Black clouds move. They do move. And things will get better, but you just have to hang in there and be patient and give yourself some slack. Really take good care of yourself. That means building core fitness, an essential component for a healthy back. You're working on bone, you're working on muscle, you're working on ligaments. Ligaments are the pieces of tissue that connect 
bone to bone, and tendons are the tissue that connects bone to muscle. And then you want to build flexibility in your joints. So you're working on all of that. As you use all those other core muscles that we're challenged to use in here at high, high levels, it just it balances out your back. I fought coming to physical therapy for years, and it works, and, um, and it's so rewarding. That surprised me. For Belton Noseworthy, the approach worked for years. But a tipping point came when his doctor called after one of his routine follow-up exams. I told her I was driving, and she said, I want you to drive to the nearest emergency room immediately. And I said, why? And she said, because I just, I'm looking at your MRI report, and you've got severe spinal cord compression. If you get in a car accident, you can be paralyzed. That was a wake-up call for me. Belton learned of a new treatment to decompress the spine. Now we have a newer technology where we can uh, put in a device, uh, we call it artificial disc, where it would still maintain the motion instead of feeding the spine. Even though I was terrified of surgery, I didn't care. I just, I just wanted some relief from the pain. When Belton awoke from the surgery, he said he didn't feel any pain. It was amazing. I went to work in two days. They actually gave me a prescription for pain pills and I never even took one. And I was back to running within two weeks and back to cycling within a month. There weren't any more ice packs. I didn't have to worry about going on all the long drives. And just he was, you know, back to what I'd seen, you know, when I married him. I feel like I felt before I had the the episodes that started in my mid-30s. With more experimental treatments reaching FDA approval, the question became, could a new option help Paul Levois? That's when he kind of said, you know, there is something that is coming out and we have never tried it and it's, it's called a stimulator, it's an electronic thing. Dr. Samir Sheth is essentially a spine electrician. He specializes in treating neuropathic pain, a problem with the body circuitry. And these patients will present with pain that is uh, random in nature. It's often worse at night. It can be burning, shooting, stabbing, um, a wide variety of descriptors. People often describe this as kind of a pacemaker of the spine. It's the use of electrical stimulation to help jam that signal. What people feel when we use this this wire, which gets inserted not on the spinal cord, but in the area around the spinal cord, called the epidural space. The patient feels a little bit of a sensation, kind of a tingling, a comfortable tingling sensation, and that replaces the pain that they're experiencing. Because the operation takes place near so many crucial nerves, this surgery is reserved for patients for whom other treatments have failed. But for the right patient, the results can be remarkable. When Paul's pain creeps up, he simply uses a remote control to dial up the implant signal. Once the pain hits you, you can change it. You can locate your stimulation wherever the pain is. And your pain goes, within, goes out within seconds. So that's how fast it is. Most of my days are zero. Uh, I took a whole bunch of medication that I had and my wife just, we dumped everything because I don't need him anymore. I just don't take him anymore. Uh, it's, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. It's been amazing knowing that he can finally feel like he has his life back and we feel right. like we have our dad back. This is my Model A, 1931. I restored it, I love it. With a clarity of thought that often comes with successful treatment, Belton Noseworthy can reflect on lessons he's learned from his back pain ordeal. I've learned that there are some preventative measures that I probably could have done to better protect my C-spine and my neck area. Um, I've learned stretching and strengthening exercises, very subtle exercises through all the bouts of physical therapy that I've been through. I've learned poor posture can lead to this, and I think that's probably, you know, correct posture when you're driving. That's the right height? That would be a good height. But we know some corporations actually ask their employees to take a break 
every two hours to try to do some exercises just to get out of that position, which we would strongly recommend. And you're going to place one arm above your head, and as you do it, you're gonna have tall posture to begin with. And then, without altering the head or chest, stretch the arms in opposite directions. As scientists make new discoveries about how pain works, for those who are willing to embrace a new lifestyle, investing part of each day to manage and prevent pain, the reward can be a better quality of life, filled with well-being, purpose, even adventure. And it's literally life-changing and life-giving. I'm eight years out, eight years and four months out from my surgery, and I haven't taken a pain pill since then. Just being able to do things together with my dad again, and you know, the better he feels, the better he can be, you know, our dad again, and it, and it feels great. It's baby steps a little bit at a time. Like I was skiing yesterday up in the mountains, and just, it's thoroughly healthy for my mind, healthy for my soul. It's exhilarating. It's a sense of freedom, accomplishment, that I did it, that I won, that I'm winning. To order a DVD copy of this program, call 888-814-3923 or visit kvie.org. This Viewfinder episode is supported by UC Davis Health System, transforming the future of healthcare.